you've spoken before about how much you admire um, the European style welfare state. I'm just I'm curious to know what your thoughts on why the U.S. didn't develop its own welfare state and whether race has anything to do with it. I think race may have something to do with it, but I think essentially what we have seen in this country is the lack of a strong workers' movement. Uh, in Europe, I think you have seen political parties, labor parties, uh, social democratic parties, who have stood up and said that we've got to make government work for all of us. Everybody is entitled to health care. Public education, public uh, universities and, and colleges should be tuition free. Uh, seniors deserve to have strong retirement benefits. Workers have rights. We're pro union. You have seen a stronger working class political movement in Europe than I think historically you've seen in the United and, States. And why, and why is that? Why, what, what is unique about the United States that has prevented it from having a real Labour Party? That's a great question. Uh, and I think I could tell you in, in some respects, uh, way back when, in, in the 1920s or earlier than that, where there really was a strong coming together of workers, the government came down really very hot on, uh, on the uh, Socialist Party of the time. Uh, during the 50s, you had attacks against uh, the labor movement through McCarthyism. Uh, so I think in this country, there has been a real hostility for the working people to get together, uh, to stand together, to create a government that works for everybody. And that's just the reality of where we're at. And um, I think that many people in, in my generation, many young people, um, don't quite understand how unions work or they don't feel identified by uh, the labor movement. Uh, how, how, does, how would you make a union sexy again for young people? That's a great, great question. Look, the answer is pretty simple. What a union is, is an understanding that when people come together, they have more power. That if you are dealing with your employer and you're getting low wages and you go up to your boss and say, hey, can you give me some more money? The guy says, hey, you know what, I got 10 other people who want your job. But if you walk in with a union and you sit down and you have collective bargaining and you have the power to strike, for example, then your owners have got to listen to you. They have to listen to your demands. So that's historically what unions have been about. Now, in the last many years, we have seen a decline in trade unionism in this country for a lot of reasons. And you're right. I think there are millions of young people who really are not familiar with what unions are about. Uh, and the reason for that is we've seen many manufacturing jobs which were unionized uh, leave this country. We've seen anti-union activity. Uh, but basically, if we are looking as we are today, uh, Fernando, at a generation, your generation, which everything being equal will have a lower standard of living than your parents, we're moving in the wrong direction. Clearly, young people have got to stand together, to come together, to demand that public colleges and universities be tuition free that we raise the minimum wage to a living wage, that we join the rest of the industrialized world and have health care for all, et cetera. But bottom line of what a union is, is that alone there are limits to what you can do. When you stand with your brothers and sisters, there's a lot you can do. What, what about in this sort of new so-called sharing economy? Like how, does, how, do you, how do you create a sort of a strong labor movement when a lot of the jobs are you know, sort of at will, uh, part time employment. How do you kind of do you, do you have to create a new class of workers or a new class or a new economic system? But let's understand I don't think you have to create a new economic system, but what we have to do is recognize that a lot of these part time jobs are just not great jobs. Uh, that many people who want to work full time are forced to work uh, part time. So, what do we have to do? I think uh, number one, we need new trade policies so that corporate America invests in this country rather than shutting down here and moving abroad. Uh, I think number two, uh, we need to raise the minimum wage to a living wage. I believe it should be $15 an hour. Number three, as I've just mentioned, uh, we need to create millions of decent paying jobs. All right? Youth unemployment is very, very high in this country. We have got to invest in, among other things, rebuilding our infrastructure, transforming our energy system to combat climate change. When you do that, you create jobs. You know, one of the, one of the topics that has, uh, has risen lately um, in terms of our race relations is uh, a lot of African Americans are starting to call for reparations for the many years of stolen labor um, through slavery. Is that something that you would support as president? No, I don't think so. Uh, I mean, I think it would be, first of all, its likelihood of getting through a Congress is nil. Second of all, I think it would be you know, very divisive. I think the real issue is when we look at the poverty rate among the African-American community, 
uh, when we look at the high unemployment rate within the African American community, the incarceration rate within the African American community, we have a lot of work to do. So I think what we should be talking about is making massive investments in rebuilding our cities, in creating millions of decent paying jobs, in making public colleges and universities tuition free and working on childcare. Basically, targeting our federal resources to the areas that it is needed the most and where it is needed the most are in impoverished communities, often African American and Latino. For many people on, on the left, progressives, whatever, when they see um, the support that a guy like Donald Trump is having, and they see the kinds of things that the supporters are saying, and the kind of things that he's saying, um, it's very easy to sort of dismiss and mock. Um, but it seems to me that his support is so widespread that it seems to be like our collective problem. Um, how do you reckon, how do you stare into the eyes of a, of a Trump supporter and convince them and bring them over to the other side. How I do that, and I will do that, as a matter of fact, is to say, look, I know that you're angry, and I know that you're frustrated, and you're working longer hours for low wages, your kids can't afford to go to college, uh, your wife is working, you're going nowhere in a hurry. Don't take it out on the Latino community. That's not the fault, it's not their fault that your standard of living has declined and that almost all new income and wealth is going to the top 1%. Don't take it out on the Muslim community. We have got to stand together around an agenda that is not based on hatred, but is based on addressing the real issues that we face. So if you're working longer hours for low wages, what does it mean? It means maybe you need a trade union. Let's make it easier for you to get into a union. It means certainly we have to raise the minimum wage. We need new trade policies. We need to join the rest of the world and have health care for all. Work with us to create a nation, an economy that works for all. Don't take out your anger on people who are worse off than you are. Okay? And we, will, we have got to do uh, everything that we can together to take on this bigotry and xenophobia of Trump and some of the others. Why, why do you think the, the Democratic Party has given up on the white working class or trying to win them over? Uh, well, I certainly have not. I am from the white working class, so you know, those are people that I feel very comfortable with. You know, I think that one of the great problems that we have in politics today is the degree to which money influences a lot of decisions. And what you are seeing now in the Republican Party and in the Democratic Party is virtually all of the major candidates having super PACs. And when you have a super PAC, you've got to go around the world and you've got to chase folks who are prepared to contribute a half a million dollars or a million dollars. And when you begin to do that, you forget about the needs of ordinary people and you're suddenly in a mindset of worrying about your campaign contributors, the wealthiest people in this country. So I am very proud that in this campaign, I'm the only candidate on the uh, running for the Democratic nomination who does not have a super PAC, don't want their money. We have raised more, we have seen more individual contributions come into our campaign any, than any campaign in the history of this country. It averages $27. So my job is to stand with working people and to take on the big money interests who have so much influence over the uh, economy and the political life of this nation. If you had to prepare someone in 30 seconds to run a presidential campaign, what would you tell them? It's tough. I mean, it's tough. You're not going to be home a whole lot. You're going to be on the road a whole lot. You're going to see a lot of hotel rooms. Uh, you're going to give a lot of speeches. You've got to worry about your voice that it doesn't get uh, hoarse. But on the other hand, it is very, very exhilarating, especially when we are seeing the kind of incredible support that we're seeing uh, from a lot of folks, especially who have given up on the political process or, or have not been involved, a lot of young people, working class people. So what I would say is think twice about doing it, and I did. We, we thought, my wife and I thought a whole lot about it, doing it. But once, you're getting, once you get into it, uh, there are the ups and the downs, but it is a very exhilarating uh, process, and I'm very glad that I did it. <laughs>